Hi, welcome to Toys in the Hood. Today I'm taking a look at the Warhammer 40,000 Compendium. This is one of the first expansions for Rogue Trader, uh, and it's where we really, really start to see the Imperium taking shape. It was released in 1989. It's the second sort of pure Warhammer 40,000 expansion. The other one I've covered in another video, that's chapter approved Book of the Astronomicon. There were other expansions with Warhammer 40,000 in. So there was Warhammer Siege, and then there were the Chaos books, the Realm of Chaos books, the Lost and the Damned and the Slaves to Darkness. Those covered Chaos, but they all of these books were Warhammer Fantasy Battle in the main. They actually had a little bit of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay in, and then a little bit of Warhammer 40,000. The Warhammer 40,000 Compendium is mostly a collection of White Dwarf articles, largely focused on the armies of the Imperium. And by mostly, I mean I'm reasonably sure they're all articles from White Dwarf, but I haven't seen all the White Dwarfs to be able to back that up. And it's also the first book where the setting really starts to feel like the setting we know and love. Space Marines feel more superhuman than ever before, and we start getting loads of iconic units. We get Terminators, Rough Riders and Ogrins are all introduced here. So let's take a look. Right, let's take a look inside. So this is White Dwarf presents the Warhammer 40,000 compendium. It is largely a collection of White Dwarf articles. First off, we've got a picture of Imperial Commander Marnius Kalgar, Lord McCrag. So this is before Marnius Kalgar has become Chapter Master, or rather this is before the term Chapter Master exists. Some odd little bits about this picture. He's got the iconic power fists there. They stay with him for a while. And in fact, this was a model that you could buy of, of Minus Calgar on the throne, which is quite cool. There's these funny little alien creatures here. One of whom seems to have a notepad and a quill on his head. And my favourite bit that I've only noticed today is here is a picture of the Emperor on the Golden Throne. So here's a portrait of that behind him. Brilliant. Here's the contents. Well, I mean, I'm going to talk through those anyway. So, uh, so there they are. If you, want to, if you want to pause and read that, you can see what's coming up. We've got the Mentor Legion. Now, the Mentor Legion are space marines that are tasked with testing new weapons and equipment, which is kind of interesting in itself, as for quite a while in the law, it, it's been that it takes many hundreds of years for new technology to be tested and approved. Kind of cool, you've got a whole space marine chapter about this. Their symbol is an owl, so clearly they must be wise. Uh, there's a note here that the, um, the, the commander has visited the emperor on several occasions. Although it's also said to be speculation. And the last thing on this page that I thought was really cool, this here looks a lot like the Storm Talon, the Space Marine um, fighter jet, which, considering the fighter jet wouldn't be made for 30 years after this, I think it's, it's kind of neat. I wonder if they look back at this picture and thought that's what they should look like. So this article is talking about the creation of a Space Marine. It is, it's set in a laboratory in Earth, not in Terra, a laboratory in Earth. But before we get to that, you've got this little bit here. Thought for the day, we can rebuild them. Now, brilliant for an article that's about building space marines, but that's also kind of a pun on the tagline of Steve Austin, the six million dollar man, which would have been on television at the time. And that is, we have the technology, we can rebuild him. This article explains that the first founding of space marines were for 20 chapters, but only seven survive. But then there's been 25 founding since then. And it takes us through the 19 implants, the organs that are put in to make a space marine. I'm not going to go into them in much detail, about any detail, but I will just mention there's the Omofega, which is, where is it? That is phase eight. And this is part of the brain. And this allows space marines, when they've um, defeated their enemies, they can consume someone's brain and learn their memories from it. There's also the Betcher's gland, which is really cool. There's two of these glands either side. And these mean that a space marine can spit poison and it's so corrosive that it's noted that they can chew their way out of iron bars if they're given an hour or so in a prison. When they produce the organs they're grown in test slaves. I mean that sounds like a really really horrific fate and it's also noted that only the emperor can give permission for the creation of a new chapter. So the emperor at this point in the 40k universe is a little bit more hands-on than he is nowadays. He talks about how some chapters will make their own modifications. So we have a space wolf here now their canines are taken out and replaced at this point. Now it's the Canis Helix that does that. When that's implanted, that's what causes the Space Wolves to become more wolf-like. And then there's lastly, there's a note here that if it doesn't work, then uh, misfits may be put into a suicide assault squad or used as suicide bombers, which I think it's fair to say that is not an idea that has aged well. Our next article is Terminator Squads or Space Marine Tactical Dreadnought Armour. And this, this article takes a look at Terminator Armour and the weapons they have. Got some great artwork here of Terminator armor. Note that the Dark Angel at this point is wearing black. 
the Deathwing, the white armoured Dark Angels would come along later. You've also got all these really nicely illustrated weapons. The weapon rules themselves are a lot com more complicated than nowadays. You know, you've got lots of special rules. The librarian here needs to use psi points to power it as well. You've got the strength, damage, save modifiers, an area effect. You know, I cannot remember all of these. <laughs> Quite a few weapons here. The weapon stats are a lot more detailed than they are nowadays. You've got short range and long range. You get a bonus quite often to hit at close range. You then have your strength there, damage to the ice, a save modifier, and different types of area effects and things. And then they have their own special rules as well. So like the four sacks can use the librarian's side points to power itself and become even stronger. Really nice part here with lots of details. The captain's shoulder badge is said to contain a sliver of the Emperor's armour from the attack on Horus's battle barge at the end of the Horus Heresy. And I really like this kind of breakdown of the weapons and where they go. It almost feels like an assembly guide for them. Our next page, as this artwork shows, is going to be about commissars and chaplains. So we've actually got an Imperial Commissar here fighting alongside Space Marine chaplains. At this point, Space Marines and uh, Imperial Guard are a lot more kind of hands-on with fighting each other, with, with each other. So we learn that chaplains haven't changed much. They're responsible for the spiritual well-being of the chapter. They're fanatical warriors. Right from the beginning, they're armed with the Crozius Arcanum. And it's noted that the Crozius Arcanum is made from alien technology. On this page, we've got our first uh, army entry here. Similar to how army lists are nowadays, actually. You've got a lot of stats in one section. Of course, you've got points costs, which are no longer a thing for equipment. And you've got the option of having champions, minor heroes and major heroes. So you've got three levels of characters and they're different points depending on what you go for. We've then got some painted models here. It discusses how the colours will work and it basically notes that quite often, so chaplains will wear black, but their legs will be the colour of the Space Marine chapter that they're parts of. And you can see some here. I think this one's a Space Wolf one with grey legs. This one looks like it's probably a Crimson Fist with the kind of dark purple legs and this, well, Crimson trimming. And then over the next page, we've got Imperial Guard Commissars. So while Marines are devoted to the Emperor, the Imperial Guard are less so. And this means the Commissars are a lot more concerned with discipline than spiritual well-being. While Marines are devoted to the Emperor, the Imperial Guard, not so much. And as a result, the Commissars are more concerned with discipline than the spiritual well-being of their charges. They wear an Imperial Guard uniform, but then over that they wear a heavy black greatcoat. They have peaked caps displaying skull symbols and skull-shaped badges and buckles. And both chaplains and commissars use rhinos or land raiders. These will be painted black and marked with skulls where possible. <laughs> we have a marvellous quote here. Just below this picture. Inspiration grows from the barrel of a gun. So here we're on to medics. You've got this great piece of artwork here, which is Space Marine Apothecaries fighting alongside an Imperial Guard medic, pulling an injured Space Marine along. Again, a Crimson Fist, I think. They're kind of, yeah, in fact, definitely a Crimson Fist. They're kind of the poster boys of uh, Warhammer at this point, I think. Those Space Wolves... And then White Scars are described as being the kind of typical Space Marine chapter in the chapter approved book. And there's a White Scar here. In fact, a White Scar doing a field transfusion. This little bit of breakout text here is a really great piece about when a Marine is hit by mole mortar. So mole mortars are mortars, but they fire underground rather than being lobbed in the air. And the apothecary has to administer the Emperor's Grace. And he does this with a Carnifex. Now this isn't the giant Tyranid monster. The Carnifex here is a type of bolt gun. And again, not a bolt gun like a bolter, but it's a bolt gun like the kind you'd use to kill f cattle. And the Carnifex is a very appropriate name here, because the Carnifex was the executioner in the Roman legions. And then in the story, in fact, they also, they harvest the gene seed, which is something that in the game later on it will tell you. It allows you to recapture the victory points of space marines that are killed. They're doing it to ensure the future of their chapter. But it's a really neat way of kind of tying that in with the game. And say here you've got this field transfusion which is interesting that it's mentioned we don't really hear details nowadays that much of what medics do in the game although i am a little out of touch with a lot of the modern fluff it tells us about the equipment that the medics use so most of them will use chainsaws and bolt pistols in the marines in the army they'll have las pistols and chainsaws i mean bolt pistols las pistols a fairly standard affair for members of the guard and space marines i guess the chainsaws come in quite handy if you need to do a um, amputation a field amputation there's a mention here too about an ultramarine medic carefully saving the progenoid glands of a fallen brother after the destruction of High Fleet Behemoth. Now, this is quite a way before Tyranids are really, really fleshed out and we actually get a Tyranid list. But it's quite cool to see that these things are in the rules, in the background, right at the beginning. And again, we've got uniforms shown here. So 
this page kind of made me smile because it talks about how medics will mainly wear white apart from the shoulder pads. If we look at the pictures here, not many of them were wearing white apart from the shoulder pads. But then it occurred to me that, well, actually, if you had a whole page of Marines and guards just wearing white with shoulder pads, it'd be a bit boring. So, of course, they're showing the variations. And you've got guardsmen, you've got space marines, but you've also got squats there. There's a wound chart for the game. If you're looking at ongoing penalties, if you're playing a campaign, you know, a series of games, then your characters can start getting beaten up, which works quite well at this point in Warhammer 40,000 because you're playing with much smaller armies. You know, you might have 30 models aside. There's a bit of text here about amputating an arm. And then here there's this horrible image of a blood drinker medic preparing to administer the final service to a fatally injured trooper. Very pleasant. On a more cheerful note, we've got this really awesome picture of Silver Skull Space Marines on bikes, which I just love. Our next section talks about the Badab War. Now, I love the Badab War. I used to have a massive Red Scorpion army, um, although I could only find two awful pictures of it. I sold them all in the end when the Primaris models came out, and they just looked so dated and it made me sad. The Badab War, in a nutshell, is an uprising of Space Marines in the Badab sector. It's led by Luft Huron, who is the tyrant of Badab. Now, at this time, he's the master of the Tiger Claws, but later on, the Tiger Claws become the Astral Claws. The Astral Claws, or rather the Tiger Claws, are then joined by the Mantis Warriors, the Executioners and Lamenters. These are all Space Marine chapters. The Firehawks are then sent to stop them. And then the Red Scorpions and the Minotaurs and the Nova Marines and the Howling Griffins pile in as well. And then even more Marines are sent in. There's the Exorcists, the Fire Angels, the Salamanders, the Space Sharks, who would become the Kakaradans, and the Sons of Medusa. In fact, here's a picture of many of the participants. Now, in the end, the Emperor wins out, or the Imperium wins out, rather. The Mantis Legion, the Executioners and the Lamenters, who have betrayed the Emperor at this point, are actually forgiven, but they have to go on a hundred-year kind of penal crusade to redeem themselves. The Tiger Claws are virtually destroyed and disappear into deep space. They become, so they become the Tiger Claws, become the Astral Claws, who then become the Red Corsairs in later Chaos Armies. I can't remember which edition it was. One of the um, Chaos Space Marines was kind of bigger on not having the traditional kind of founding Space Marine, Chaos Space Marines, you know, like the Empress Children, the Death Guard, and was more about, well, what do you get with rebel Space Marines? And that's one of them. And one of the things the Red Corps says is you end up with Marines in normal armour who then have kind of a red cross over all of their um, chapter symbols. Now, Forge World really, really ran with this little bit. And they did a series of books and models about the Badab War. Sadly, all pre-Primaris models, so they look really dated now. But they really went for it with Red Scorpions, and they did several books involving them. And as I say, we've got two pages of these colour schemes here, which are absolutely fantastic. You've got, as well as kind of your normal like Space Shark colour schemes, you've got this camouflage as well. So Space Marines would wear, wear different armour, depending on where they were fighting. Here we've got all the participants in the Badab War. So we've got the Firehawks. The Firehawks would later get lost in the warp and they basically become the Legion of the Damned. At least that's what the lore implies. Mantis Warriors. Mantis Warriors with the Tranquility Campaign Sniper Unit. Camo there. An Executioner's Tactical Squad. Tiger Claws, who, as we said, become the Astral Claws, who then become the Red Corsairs. The Marines Errant. And two colour schemes. Lamenters. Red Scorpions. So Red Scorpions, when uh, Forge World picked this up, they get more of a dark grey armour uh, there. But then there's also these Red Scorpions with this red armour, which looks surprisingly cool. Minotaurs, Nova Marines. Well, in fact, maybe it was a Nova Marine that we saw earlier, uh, which I thought was Crimson Fist. There's a Howling Griffins, two of those. I've always loved this kind of quartered paint scheme. It's uh, kind of very feudal. It looks really, really good. Raptor Legion to their blizzard suit. So I guess that's their snow camo. The exorcists, the fire angels, fire angels in drop troop camouflage, salamanders. So salamanders that actually look like salamanders rather than the dark green armor they have nowadays. Space sharks. Space sharks become the carcaridans. I think carcaridan is basically like Latin for um, shark. So, uh, so they've sort of, um, they've used that. Then a camouflage space shark. And again, this yellow and black kind of camouflage. Sons of Medusa and Sons of Medusa in desert armour. It's a really, really great spread there. And I mean, it's pretty awesome when you consider that in the Forge World books later on, they kind of really embrace these kind of technical drawings and these spreads of just colour schemes and things. Really, yeah, really makes these books look great, I think. This next article is Rough Riders and White Shields. 
the opening to this article, the first bit, it's a really good snapshot of the Imperium talking about how there's feral and medieval worlds, how the cultures are really diverse, and then kind of going on to talk about how important the bond between a rider and its mount are, and how they'll end up inducted into the guard. And basically, rough riders and their mounts are inducted into the guard. They're then trained in guard tactics, and they're given an explosive lance. A picture here of the 9th Necromundan Regiment. I mean, it, it kind of describes the action here, talks about it a bit, and what's going on. I think this was the cover of an old um, Imperial Guards, the Plastic Regiments, when they first came out, maybe. Or at least this part of it was. And it's very noble. You've got the Commissar and the General here leading from the front. This really has a kind of feel of, like, you know, Napoleonic's kind of 19th century warfare going on with it. Talks about customs and rituals that they might have. It, it tells us that the horses are freeze marked on the rump with a stylized eagle surrounding the head of a horse, which I think is really, really interesting. As it says that the freeze brand they put on the horses is painless, which is the only thing I've ever read described as painless in the 41st millennium. Moving on to White Shields, we straight away have a quote here. Children, you call them, they can pull a trigger just as well as veterans, and they have the spirit of a bull narthax. Call them children if you wish. I call them troops. Good troops. Really interesting here that we've literally just had kind of a no to animal cruelty with these painless brands. But child soldiers, on the other hand, they are more than welcome in the 41st millennium. Later on, they're even described as gun babies. In fact, there you can see it, such as cadets, probationers or gun babies. Fortunately for us, the most popular name is White Shields. And these are basically like kind of veteran troops that join your army. Uh, oh, we've got a two page squat picture here. Again, I think this is off a box set originally. Talks about how they're from Homeworlds. Some have helmets, some have, some have, um, some go bareheaded. They have a lot of leeway in the weapons that they use, the armour that they use. A quote from Lehman Russ here. Only in the Space Marines of the Legions of Startes are courage and expertise perfectly blended. In other troops they are present in varying degrees and the proportions and many scholars have debated their relative merits. For my own part, I come down on the side of courage, for courage can sometimes make a virtue of inexperience. I myself have commanded Imperial Guard troops whose probator units have achieved great things because their courage was infinite and because they were too inexperienced to realise that their goal was impossible. This is Lehman Russ writing about things. I mean, Lehman Russ, well, for a start, he's quoted in a load of these early books. Um, but he also seems to do a lot of writing, which for a kind of character that's basically like a ferocious Viking, he seems very literate. Then we've got some rules here for them. White Shields are determined to prove themselves fearless, and so as a result, they basically are fearless. Their stats are, well, essentially they're slightly worse guardsmen, same kind of equipment. They're armed with las guns. One of them will have a las cannon. Next up, we've got Ogrins. Um, this article is from White Dwarf. It's from White Dwarf 115, which I've actually done a whole video on. So Ogrins are big, they're fat, they're stupid, and they're perfect for the guard. They tend to worship the Emperor more as a benevolent father figure, and this can then be exploited by the um, commissars who look after them. Particularly intelligent Ogrins will be given biochemical Ogrin neural enhancement. That's an acronym for B-O-N-E. So what you end up with is Ogrin boneheads. Ogrin boneheads becomes the sergeants, they're the smarter ones, and they're the only ones who'll be trusted with a gun. Although even when they are trusted with a gun, it's an Ogrin ripper gun. You can see here, this is a big chunky gun. It's um, <laughs> It's got ammo limiters so that they don't just fire shots everywhere and run out of ammo straight away, but it's also substantial enough to be used in a club um, if, there's a, if there's a fight. It's always interesting with Ogrins that essentially they're also um, ogres from Warhammer. So when 40k first came out, Warhammer had quite a big range. 40k was quite new. So if, if basically if Games Workshop could sell you their old ogre models, then, um, well, they would. So so they had those, and then you just had a few Warhammer 40,000 Ogrins who were, who, were, who were the boneheads armed with the actual guns. So you'd have a series of feral ogres, and then you'd be led with a sergeant ogre. This one here describes the Mordion Iron Guard. So these become the Mordion Iron Guard. They've been sent to quell a rebellion, which, uh, which they do in this. And then the defeated rebels are actually recruited into the guard to redirect their fighting skills. And here it shows the regiment. A few interesting things to kind of note. You've got an old style sentinel here. Notice this is a lot more rounded with the assault cannons on the top. Both the commander and the commissar, they ride jet bikes. And then if you also note, these are tactical squads, these Imperial Guard tactical squads. So at this point, it's not just Marines that have tactical squads. And actually, they have the same kind of weapon loadout. You know, you'll have a special weapon, you'll have 10 members, you'll have a heavy weapon. 
Um, and then you'll have a sergeant with some sort of assault weapon. Just popping back a page, you can see that they also have the Ogrins. They've got um, Beastmen. So Beastmen are very much part of the guard here. Like, Abhumans... Well, basically, the Imperium hates mutants and Abhumans unless it can find a use for them. And here, it very clearly has found a use for Beastmen. You've also got some Rough Rider squads, which we've talked about. You've got Ratlings. So Ratlings are essentially halflings so just like ogres become ogrins then halflings become ratlings in 40k there's a penitent regiment somewhere where has that gone yeah here we go one penal battalion squad 10 penitents all armed with las guns and then some adeptus mechanicus detachment adeptus mechanicus you had to have an adeptus mechanicus in order to then have weapons at this time so you've got the two rhinos so this is Imperial Guards using Rhinos, using Space Marine vehicles. Thud guns, which are basically a massive piece of artillery. Same with the Rapier Multi-Laser. And then there's two Sentinels as well. And you'd need Adeptus Mechanicus to be part of your army to be able to look after these. So now this article is all about Dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts here aren't the Dreadnoughts that we know and love today. They actually have pilots, and those pilots can, well, they can just leave the suit if they need to. It, it talks here about three. You've got a... Three Imperial Battle Armour classes, the Contemptor Dreadnought, the Deradio, and the Furibundus. And then these are whimsically known by troops as Chuck, Eddie, and Fury. Talks a bit about how the Dreadnoughts are made, how the Mechaniacs, the Orc ones, will um, will put the, the Orc Dreadnoughts together. Technically advanced Eldar have giant automated factories in their craft worlds. Talks about how they're more elegant and aesthetic. But it is interesting that the Eldar dreadnoughts aren't made out of wraith bone at this point they're still made out of metal yeah there, there you go they're made from adamantium it talks a bit here about the control systems the sort of the mind links that help um, the eldar control it they get a bit more uh, basically they get uh, less advanced as you go through the different uh, races so by the time you get to orcs they tend to be rather primitive and they're driven more like a vehicle and then it's got rules to actually put your own dreadnought together which is kind of cool you um you have a series of build points that you get and then you can use these build points to buy bits and build your um, build your dreadnought. So you you know you can buy different control control systems. So you can have a mind impulse, which is quite a few points for a human, not many points for an Eldar and an orc can't have it. A spinal link is another way, or a driver. And then these give you bonuses when it comes to your initiative. So the initiative has gone now from 40k, I think, but it used to be how quickly that you would uh, fight in combat. So you buy the stats, you buy the weapon skill, you buy the ballistic skill, the strength, the toughness, the da uh, the damage. So you've got, rather than wounds, you've got damage, you know, how many hits you can take. Uh, your initiative, that's how quickly you strike in combat. The number of attacks you have, your saving throw, the hard points. So hard points are basically how many weapons you can equip to your Dreadnought. And then the E is equipment, things like targeters, ejector seats. In fact, there's a large list of them here. So you can have sensor packs, power fields, things like that. You choose the power plant that you're going to have, and you, then you choose the weapons. And here we go. Special attacks that the Dreadnoughts can have in close combat. So they can have power claws. There's a tread attack they can have, a headbutt. They can do a trip. They can do a bear club. A... There's also, there's this wonderful quote here. Ride the lightning from the Poena Metallica battle cry. This is Ride the Lightning is a Metallica song. It would have been from the mid-80s, which probably makes this the most shameless quote in a Games Workshop product. The Legion Metallica then become one of the Imperial Knights, I believe, or it might be one of the Forge Worlds of the Legion Metallica. They then get a whole load of special attacks they can make. So they can make a tread attack, where they kind of a stomp attack. They can do a headbutt. They can do they can trip something over. They can do a bear hug. And then Orc Dreadnoughts have their power claws as well that they can use in close combat. A bit about shooting and then you know different charts for where you take your damage when you hit lovely breakdown here of the um furiosa class furibundus class sorry in fact sorry it's worth taking a, a second here you'll see that dreadnoughts here they're a lot more rounded than they were before you've got the place there where the main driver does actually sit so it's not the tomb that kind of more modern dreadnoughts become there's chuck we've got a double bolter combination there then the eldar dreadnoughts the war demon eldar assault dreadnought and the war cry Eldar Assault Dreadnought. And some colours here. Some of these kind of these checkered patterns are really quite ghastly. So you can see you've got the Eldar here, you've got Prince Ariel's personal company there. The Orc Dreadnoughts either have four arms or two arms, which works really well with the kit because you could basically buy another ring and extra arms to kind of build it upwards if you wanted to. And then you've got the different robot classes. Now, a lot of these names 
are used nowadays still by like you know i think forge world must have read through these when they were making the more modern books and just taken all the ideas from them so you've got your colossus class you've got your castellan class the crusader class um cataphract class so these either become like suits of terminator armor or they become types of knights something like that and again there's the red scorpions quite popular at this time and then orc dreadnoughts yeah here you can see the different ring that goes in the middle it gives them the extra height just there so we've got war walkers here i mean basically they're pretty much the same rules as dreadnoughts they've got a shield and then they've got scatter lasers you can see there the eldar is exposed at the front and this marvelous quote here today's thought hope is the beginning of unhappiness and then there's a kind of chapter approved on more eldar now what this is looking at well firstly it actually starts talking about the infinity circuit although the infinity circuit rather than nowadays what the infinity circuit is is when eldar die their spirits go into their spirit stones and those spirit stones are kind of uploaded into the um, into the infinity circuit where they live in the craft world now what they can do here is rather than the spirit stones they actually upload their thoughts and memories in the process and it does actually kill them when they do it so becoming one of these one of these spirit warriors is a very very big deal we have here we actually have now before so we've got lord phoenix ironstorm spirit warrior beale town craft world so the phoenix lords aren't part of the eldar at this point but lord phoenix is a title that they have and it's cool because just like with imperial this is giving us the basis of eldar and how they form so this is looking at spirit warriors and ghost warriors spirit warriors are basically small dreadnoughts later on they become more of like the wraith guard and then there's these ghost warriors ghost warriors are much more nimbler they go on infiltration missions assassination missions they're made from a plastic compound that's called stealthine and then they have a whole in fact they have a whole host of special rules there's eight special rules for them there so they're fearless they're not going to rout stealthine is invisible to most sensors um ghost warriors can have lots of weapons they have sensor packages and things next up we've got revised rules for vehicle rules and um, basically it toughens vehicles up gives them more weapon options and then there's much more detailed series of damage charts as well as we go in here looking at hit locations and then what happens a great page here of loads of painted rhinos again we've got guard rhinos here we've got space marine rhinos we've got some like we've got medic rhinos there it shows you that we had earlier we talked about the chaplain so you've got a black chaplain rhino there and some of these are camouflaged and some of these are just your kind of normal chapter colors more vehicle rules and then a chapter approved land raider so um land raiders one of the <laughs> what jumps out here uh, one of the things is that when they make a land raider they sacrifice a predator cat as part of it and then there's a story here which is where um, Harlequins are actually using, so Eldar Harlequins are using a captured Land Raider when they fight. Talks about the different camo schemes that they might use there. Again, Red Scorpions come up. In fact, if I turn over the page, we have here a quote, camouflage is the color of fear. I have no need to hide from my foes. I have no fear of death. My colors I wear openly. They proclaim louder than any words. I am proud to live, I am proud to die. Now this is from Commander Carob Cole of the Red Scorpions. Commander Carob Cole, the leader of the Red Scorpions, and he's a massive part of the Anthelion project. In fact, a lot of the Forge World books talk up, talk about him and the Red Scorpions, uh, which now I did a video oh, 10 years ago. It was one of my very first videos before I forgot about my YouTube channel for nine years. And that's a review of the Anthelion project. So you can check that out for a look at that. More recently, Arbiter Ian has also done a video on the Anthelion project. So well, that's probably a lot slicker than the one I did a while back. So it's well worth a watch. As I said, Forge World really got stuck into the Red Scorpions. And one of the things about Red Scorpions is they don't infiltrate. They're very proud. You know, they, they don't sneak around. And that's that's kind of from this quote. Our next article is the turn of the Predator tank. Pretty straightforward. Uh, at this point, it's armed with a turret-mounted autocannon, two LAS cannons. It notes that it's got a crew of four. So you've got a driver and three gunners. But it can function without the crew in it if necessary. And it's just like the Rhino and the Land Raider. They say at this point these are auto systems they're called. Later on it becomes the machine spirit. The crew are actually wired into the machines and can't leave the Predator during the battle. Which can mean that during a battle, well, if it explodes or anything, they're going to get engulfed as well. And actually it says here that as punishment, some crewmen for insubordination are hardwired into their vehicles and are only released after an exceptional show of valour. That's talking about Space Marines and Imperial Guardsmen doing that. 
Oh, and it also says that while there's limited space in there, it can actually carry passengers. It can carry up to five passengers if necessary. A bit different, like later on, the Predator wouldn't carry passengers, but the Razorback used to be able to carry, I think, six Marines or something. That, that, so this seems to have more of that role. Quite straightforward, army list there, 600 points in either Guard or Space Marines. Note from here, and you'll see it in the older models, the, the top is curved. It's not the blocky shape that we're used to nowadays. Then the next article is on bikes, and you can add bikes to Imperial Guard, Marines, Rogue Trader entourages, and then Squat Army. Squats are a huge fan of bikes as well. This next chapter is all about the Devastator box set that's coming out for the Citadel Designers. That box set had a Land Speeder, a Mole Mortar, and a Tarantula. So the Tarantula's first up. The Tarantula is basically the same as like the sentry guns in Aliens. It's an automated weapon, it's on a tripod. Uh, it does have a crewman who can move it, use it to select targets. And then you, yeah, you set it up and it, it blasts enemies. What weapon does it have at this point? At various times, yeah, here we go. So it can have multiple weapons. So um, so any any two heavy weapons on there. So it could be two last cannons, two heavy bolters. It can move or fire, it can't do both. It needs setting up. Mole mortar is a similar kind of thing. The mole mortar is, well, it's a mortar, but rather than lob shells in the air, it shoots the, the shells under the ground and they explode underneath their target. And then there's the land speeder. The land speeder is pretty straightforward. Well, I mean, it's, it's basically like a kind of flying chariot at this point. You've got two Marines or two Guardsmen sat on two seats at the front of it. They've got a heavy weapon. They fly around the battlefield. Funnily enough, the Devastator's box set doesn't actually feature Devastator Space Marines. We've then got the rapier carrier with multi-laser this is a multi-laser but it's on tracks you have one crew that sits on it and then you've got a spotter as well thud gun thud gun fires multiple shells over a battlefield it's basically an artillery piece in fact it's got a very kind of um well well real world sort of world war ii uh, no not the thud gun is an artillery piece it's very reminiscent of like the great war kind of the you know the turn of the 20th century kind of weaponry it's uh, got these big chunky wheels it, it feels quite archaic compared to um, a lot of the other weapons in uh, in the 41st millennium and then there's land speeder variants which can have plasma heavy plasma guns and heavy bolters so this is the the double weapons so i suppose this was later on to become the gosh was it the tornado it's been such a way I've, I've forgotten it <laughs> Oh, just to go back to third guns for a second. Sorry, you've got the template here. You've got these multiple bursts. You would fire one shot and then you would roll a dice to see which direction it is. The next shot would kind of go over there and then over there. And you basically bombard the battlefield like that with this kind of rolling fire. It's quite a neat mechanic. And these rules for craters. You can you can either create craters when you're firing at area, um, area weapons. They'll create a crater. You can then use that for cover. Or you can buy craters at the beginning of the game where you basically bombard them and put them on the battlefield to give you guys cover. I'm not normally a fan of like the newer rules. I think it's the Adeptus Mechanicus at the moment. They, they have this kind of bombardment that goes off before the game even begins. And I don't like it when you've not got a model on the table. You know when you've got some ability like command points nowadays? I don't really get that because I want... It's a miniatures game and there should be miniatures. But this kind of, this works because you are putting miniatures on the table. You're you're not so much, it's not some abstract idea. You're putting craters down. You're creating the scenery that you're going to fight over. We get on to Imperial Robots here. Talks about the Legio Cybernetic, which is one of the subdivisions of the Adeptus Mechanicus. They're responsible for the care and construction of all robots throughout the Imperium. Robots are basically built like dreadnoughts. Here you go. So, um... You've got your power plant builds, your characteristic values. It's actually, you can see like the time, this is probably, you know, this must be like six, seven months after the earlier Dreadnought build articles, because this looks a lot more professional and a lot neater. And the way these work, robots, is you create a program for them. You create like a chain of orders. Here you go, here's some. And so this one, you have, you will go, so, this is a general battle program. So you come from X, you target acquired, then go to B, which is come from B. There you go. That's the result there. If the target is in charge range, you charge and fight. Otherwise, if it's in weapon range, you either fire at it or you move towards it. So this gives you this kind of flow chart of what you might do. And you have to create that at the beginning of the battle. And then your robots have to follow it. And they give you lots and lots of pieces so that you can make up your own command charts. Picture of an orc running away. Here we go. Orc Raider Snitch 
Plastif Ant makes the first intelligent decision of his life as he runs away from the robot with a giant siege hammer. Special damage charts for robots. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, this art here this is very reminiscent of like 2000 AD and the kind of ABC warriors that they have, I think. Different examples of robots in the Imperium. Again, well, I've said this already where we saw the pictures. You've got the Crusader, the Colossus, the Cataphract, the Conqueror, the Castellan. These are all names that are, um, are you know, used elsewhere. I think there's like five different Castellans. I think Black Templars have a high Castellan. There's an Imperial Knight Castellan. There's the Adeptus Mechanicus Castellans. Then there's a, an Imperial Guard, Lord High Castellan. It's a, it's a popular name. It does a lot of, lot of work for a workshop. Then we get to Heavy Metal. So Heavy Metal is the, well, the painting section. Suddenly we're in full colour, which is nice. The old RTB-101 set there, the original Space Marine plastics, I believe, there. All painted as Crimson Fists. Got some Dark Angels in black armour. They're not in the dark green at this point. Some of these really random conversions. So remember, this is really early days. And they've got, I mean, that looks like it might possibly be from a Judge Dredd Lawmaster as a motorbike. The shield must be a fantasy shield. The propellers presumably come off some sort of airfix kit. And then you've got a Dalek here. Now, at this stage, Games Workshop did do a lot of licensed stuff. And they did Doctor Who miniatures. They, um, they had 2000 AD miniatures, which is where the judges come from. And there is even, a, somewhere, there is a test model of a Stormtrooper that they made. I think they went for the Star Wars license. Got some full colour Imperial Land Raiders here. The I think these first two, yeah, these first two are Imperial Guard. This is the Spiders. Then there's the Lucky Sevens, Red Scorpions, Dark Angels, Blood Angels, and the Raptor Legion. Very different from how we'd see them today. I mean, I can't imagine the Blood Angels um, model in orange there. And then different rhinos. Some quite cool things here. These crew that have been modelled to be standing on the rhinos. And little extras here. So you've got rolled up netting on the side. You've got these little flags. Although that does remind me, the old Rhino kit. So this is the original Rhino kit. You had these tiny little aerials on the back, these plastic aerials. And of course, they just got knocked around at the end of it. You know, you could put standards on, which looks really cool. But they would just start, snap off. And you just end up with these little square bits of plastic at the back of them. Then we've got Rick Priestley talking about making the, um, the land speeder from a deodorant can. And there it is. So, I mean, this is a real classic kind of model. He obviously loves his, um, his skimmers and his grab vehicles. Because after he left Games Workshop, he went to work for Warlord. Well, uh, he was involved with Warlord Games. I don't know what the exact relationship is. But they created the science fiction game, the hard sci-fi setting, Gates of Antares. Gates of Antares uses more of a bolt action system to play. So you alternate turns, or rather you, random, you draw random turns. So you could get two or three actions with units in a row before your opponent gets to go. But loads of the races there use different skimmers. And in fact, I mean, this is such an iconic model, but you can go, I've seen online, I think it might be on Cults 3D, you can get a 3D print files to be able to make this if you want. It's kind of fun. This one's also noteworthy. This is a Zoid. The, um, the Zoids were toys, gosh, from the, it must've been the early nineties, maybe the late eighties, and you built them, they were, they were plastic kits. But they were sort of toys as well, so um, so they had moving parts, but they were like dinosaurs, there was a massive T-Rex. This one is a Slitherzoid that they've uh, they've converted. And they, they all had little figures in. They might be more suitable if you were to really use them. They'd probably be more of an epic scale, maybe just a touch bigger. Article on how to paint Imperial Guard there. Nice and straightforward. You've got some little things about how to do, um, you know, the old Death's Head and things like that if you want to. Oh, this is the ogre model that I was talking about earlier, the ogrin. So you've got a ripper gun there. This is the sergeant. You put him with your normal fantasy ogres. And then the basics on how to paint the skull. You know, it's a circle with two dots and then this little bit underneath. You might want to create, there you go, how to make a belt buckle aquila. You do a triangle and you just cut into it. Really nice, straightforward ways of painting these things. Now this bit's the Codex Imperialis. So an extract from the great book, The Index of Startes. And it's talking about the official order of battle for Space Marine chapters. Basically, it ends up being an army list. So this section of Index Startes is now an extract from the Codex Imperialis. It's, this is basically an army list now for Space Marines. So we've got a couple of kind of inspirational quotes. There's, my will be done from Codex Imperialis. So it was in the beginning, so ever shall it be. Creator of the Iron Hands. I, th I think these are all from the Lord's Prayer, aren't they? The, um, the Catholic Prayer, you know. Um, Our Father, Iron Hands, uh, thy kingdom come, my will be done. Oh, gosh, now I can't remember off the top of my head, but it has that ring to it. Um, which, 
you know, that, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at books that kind of combine this religious kind of overtones, but also with practical military strategy. And this gives us an overview of the Marines. Uh, interestingly, it says that only young males are chosen, but it never gives a reason for this. Uh, and in fact, the earlier article we looked at on gene seed and the, um, the implants, there it, it didn't say any either that it doesn't work for, for women. You know, it seems that female space marines at this point are entirely possible. Now, this is before Primaris models, so squads are divided into tactical, assault and devastator squads. We're so told that blood angels and iron hands are rigorous, rigorously adhered to the codex. But then the dark angels have their raven wing, which is entirely mounted on bullock jet cycles. And as we go on here, equipment is randomly rolled for your characters. Although you still pay points depending on what the equipment is. It's a funny system there. The higher ranking characters get a bonus for the rolls so they can get the better equipment. We get some stuff on tech marines here. A bit of background on them. One of the really interesting things is they train with the Adeptus Mechanicus for 30 years and then they return to their chapters. And then tech marines are important for the army list because the number of vehicles you can have is limited by them so you can't have more vehicles than tech marines and the number of tech marines you have is randomly rolled which i mean i'm not sure how you're meant to actually build a kind of collection with that you know if i if i if i find that i can only have two tanks one game well i'm probably only going to buy two tanks can't see that happening nowadays so we're on to the kind of army list proper here so you've got your lieutenant commanders your captains your lieutenants so some of them so you have to have a lieutenant uh, but the others, you know, you're looking at, you can have from 0 to 1. You have to have a medic as well, actually. And you can have up to 36 tech marines, which is crazy. That's Surely that's an army of tech marines. You you must have a librarian that you, can, you don't have to have. In fact, you must have a librarian, a lieutenant, and a, um, a, a, what's it, a chaplain that we said that you must have? And a medic. But you don't have to have any tactical squads. You don't have to have any assault squads. And you don't have to have devastator squads. These are fairly standard, like we said. These are, these are 10 men. You um, you have special we well, you have one special weapon. You have a heavy weapon. You have a command uh, sergeant, and then you've got seven other marines. That was quite a big deal, I think, in like third edition when you were suddenly allowed to split squads up. It was in one of the space marine codices that rather than playing with ten men in a squad, you could play with five and five. So what you would do is your heavy weapon would stay at the back and provide support with four other men, and then the others would advance forward. That was a pretty cool way of playing. You've got your terminate squads here. All the details of those we've seen them earlier. And then on to new weapons and equipments for, um, for, for Space Marines. This quote here, by their colour will, will, will he know thee, by their banners he will fear thee, by the standard then he will dread thee. Cry Marine and let's spit the weapons of war. Which I guess is a sort of bastardised version of cry havoc and let's slit the dogs of war, which is from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Even more equipment here. Oh, you do get off table support. So you can have spotters. You have a tech Marine who's a spotter and you can request supporting fire. Yeah, I mean, all the rules, all the, all the tables that you need here. It's a good selection of what you can see, the crazy things that we used to have, you know, stun grenades, haywire grenades, which uh, mess with your vehicles, uh, virus grenades, which infect people with a virus that then catches them, stasis grenades, where you're trapped in time, and a vortex grenade, which literally opens a hole to the warp, which just destroys everything it goes around. We then get to Imperial Guard. It starts describing a fight between two warriors from two different tribes that are part of the same the same regiment that's here and it talks about how guardsmen are often recruited from the pdf the pdf are the planetary defense forces um hive gangers and tribal warriors are also encouraged to apply you've got your standard kind of platoon layout where you've got your command squad which has your commissars your medics your commanders and then everything falls under that it talks about training and deployment um how you might be posted to a rogue trader might be posted to a titan order so they can end up anywhere really uh, supply as well it talks about your equipment you basically end up with what you're given at the time then he talks about different troop types, depths and mechanics we've covered. Sanctioned psychers are used, and these can be mutated, so they can have an enlarged head. Commissars, assault platoons, rough riders, we've, we've talked about all of these. You've got your beastmen, your ogrins, and your ratlings. So your ab humans fighting for them. And then the penal battalions. Now, penal battalions have their heads shaved and tattooed with the unit insignia, and explosive slave collars are put around their neck. The collars are a disciplinary device rather than a means of turning the troops into human bombs. The blast is directed inwards, very much like the running man, the film of that. They have collars that explode. And of course, Battle Royale as well does the same thing. And again, there's a quote from Lehman Russ talking about the wonders of, uh, of having penal battalions. And then you can have human bombs. So here we go. Pretty dark. 
Um, the Emperor in his mercy has ordained that the penal battalion troops should have the opportunity to repent and atone for their crimes. And that's where the human bombs come in. Any penal legion trooper may volunteer for service as a human bomb. In addition to his normal equipment, he is fitted with an explosive harness. The moment he dons the harness, he is absolved by the Emperor and the burden of his guilt is lifted. He also has a chance of freedom, for some of the harnesses are rigged not to explode. So if he survives the battle, he is absolved and free. Pretty dark. So you've got the rules for how the um, Imperial Guard must operate and follow their um, command structure. Adeptimus Mechanicus, what we've said about that already. They can repair damaged equipment each play. Commissars, now commissars can basically, when an officer or a sergeant fails their leadership test, the commissar can summarily execute them and then take over command of the unit. Uh, sanctions, like we've said. Now they use, they use Slaves to Darkness rules. Slaves to Darkness is a chaos supplement they're bringing in. And we've got new equipment here as well. I mentioned the Ripper Gun before, stats are there. Uh, friends and Dispensers, so used to have a lot of psychology effects in the um, the old 40k. Friends on Dispensers make you frenzy, which basically means you have to kind of charge forward, but you get twice the number of attacks, I think it was, when you do get towards the enemy. Another picture of a Thud Gun. Now these are um, Imperial Guard jump packs coming in. These are very much like, again, Forge World would use these with the Elysians. The Elysians are... Um, Imperial Guard regiments that specialise in basically jump troops, your kind of halo landings, your high altitude, low opening landings. You know, they'll jump out of Valkyries and they'll um, deploy behind enemy lines. And then allies. So you can have Space Marines, of course, the Legion started, Squats, Rogue Traders, Adept Sarbates. These all make sense. Imperial Assassins. This makes sense. Notice one squad of Imperial Assassins. These aren't individual Assassins at this point. And then Harlequins and the Ordo Malayas. So the Harlequins and the Ordo Malayas are really, at this point, both, well, the Ordo Malayas always is, but very anti-Chaos forces. And they will both fight alongside the Imperial Guard if needed. Got some sample banners here. And there we go, the same kind of army list here. Oh, somebody's already written on this one. Can they have as many Adeptus Mechanicus? No, uh, no they can only have D6 Adeptus Mechanicus. The Guard are nowhere near as well equipped as the um, Space Marines. You've got your Beastman Attack Squads, you can see them there. Rattling Marksman squads, Penal Battalions, Human Bombs, Redeemed Sinners, Ogryn squads, White Shields. And your normal special equipment. We've then got our robots and our support weaponry coming in. So we've, we've seen on this already. We've got the rules for the Sentinels. And we've got squats now. So squ squats are really, at this point, they're really just Imperial Guard that use bikes occasionally. They've, um, and they're basically, they're dwarves. So you've got these strongholds and brotherhoods. There are chaos squats as well that you end up with. I should probably do an article all about this, maybe a video and look at it in a bit more of a, a bit more of a dive. But we're quite a way through this one. You have your living ancestors. So the um, the older squats, the, as they grow up, they develop psychic powers as they get a lot older, and then they they'll fight alongside and they'll act as the advisors to the um, to the squat lords as well, the hearth guard. Very much, I mean, this is a very much feel of kind of the Warhammer Dwarfs being brought into 40k. They've got this Exo armor, so they've got miniature Terminator armor. The models for those are really, really cool. Well, they were for a few years. Yeah, it's a massive fight. So you've got, you've got a human commissar, but then your squats, they're in a rhino, so we've got the same equipment. They're armed with las guns, and there's some of the trikes. Yeah, you've got rules for traitor squats. So we've got our army list. You have a warlord and your hearth guard who uh, lead it. Combat squads who are your, your main men, your weapon teams, guild master, guild weapon teams, guild bike squads, living ancestors, commissars, tech priests. There we go. So it's a pretty short army. I think one of the reasons they kind of got rid of squats for a while is there wasn't that big a difference between squats and Imperial Guard. So in fact, I remember Andy Chambers saying it in a presentation he gave one time. Uh, at a talk, I can't remember which tournament it was, but it was years ago. And they were just kind of like, well, squats just... They just weren't very exciting. I think they tried to get a feel back. You know, Leeds of Votan are a bit more interesting now uh, and have more options. Although even then they've struggled again. We haven't seen any books for them. We haven't seen anything that fleshes them out. And it's a real shame because it feels like a really cool idea, but it just doesn't seem to actually work in the game. And then we've got Harlequins. This is the first Eldar list at this point that isn't a pirate list. The Craft Worlds will get a lot more detail in the Companion, the Warhammer Companion, uh, sorry, the Warhammer Compilation that is released in 1990. So we have here the Harlequins, the High Avatar, the Solitaires fight off on their own. You've got a Master Mime, you've got the troops, which are your basic kind of troops. You've got the Death Jesters, who are your heavy weapon troops with the Shrieker ammunition, which basically, when you're shot, just means that, well, it doesn't just mean anything. It means that all of your molecules kind of explode and you're just, you're just well, erupt. And it's not so much a case of clean up as paint over by the time that's finished. 
I mean, the Harlequin's Kiss itself is a spectacularly unpleasant weapon. You've got a monofilament kind of wire that when you punch somebody with it, it goes inside them, turns their insides to soup. And they have all these bright colours and they bounce around happily. It seems crazy. But at this point, they're also, they're, like I said before, they're, they're mostly a uh, fighting chaos, you know, going through the webway. They're the guardians of the Black Library. <laughs> and these stats, as you can see, weapon skill 7, ballistic skill 7. These guys are a rock. Initiative 9, they're super fast. Uh, they've, they've always been real combat wombles bit about the black library so the black library is hidden deep in the webway and the the harlequins guard it there's a lot more about not in this book about how the harlequins and they allow like certain people i can't remember what they're called the illuminati who are humans who have been possessed by demons but survived they're then allowed to actually go in the webway they're allowed to go to the black library and see the knowledge there yeah you get death gestures your webway portals so loads of things here that really form part of the Eldar army. They're very big. Somebody's coloured these in where they've had it previously. It's quite a fun idea. These weapons used to be as well available to pretty much anyone. So the neuro disruptors could feature in other um, other armies as well. And then we've got this. So we've got a high avatar, death gestures, harlequin troops. And I believe that might be where we run out of book. Yeah, the same equipment cards. The solitaire, the high warlock, warlocks, psychic ability charts for harlequins. Uh, image here that I think may have been a front cover of a white dwarf but is now black and white handy play sheet in fact I don't think that handy play sheet should be in here at all I think that's from a copy of 40k <laughs> you could always subscribe for white dwarf at the end of it as well so there we go I do believe that is the book nice bright cheerful picture of some harlequins at the end there so thank you very much for listening you know I hope you've enjoyed that and found it interesting I've got some more books I should be going through as well. I've got the Realm of Chaos books to go through, Warhammer Siege, and a whole load of epic books as well. So I'm looking to just do the same kind of thing, reading through them, picking out my highlights, just giving you an overview of them. You know, if you've got specific questions, I've got the books, give me a shout and I'll, um, you know, I'll try and answer them. But yeah, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, tell your friends, and I will speak to you soon. Thank you. Cheers.